शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य सुधारणी जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार श्रीवासादिगौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे very very happy and grateful to be amidst all of you all today and i am very grateful to jagdish ji for uh, organizing this and having invited me here uh, and it's a pleasure to reconnect with many of you all after so many years um, and uh, hopefully today's session will uh, help you uh, personally professionally and uh, at so many levels so today i am going to be speaking on uh, this subject which is known as the magic of friendships um this is a book i just recently wrote um launched on international friendship day uh, and uh, so that i thought it would be a great apt uh, subject to speak with all of you so th um the idea of friendship is something that is really important for each and every one of us um the success in all walks of life depends on our success in relationships if we are successful in uh, our relationships then naturally we can be successful in business we can be successful in all aspects of our life but the question is how do you really become successful in uh, uh, in uh, relationships especially we're talking about friendship here um many years back i read a book and this book was called the dash of life and when i read this book i was very intrigued by the title you know what is the meaning of the dash of life you know it just didn't make any sense to me at that point so uh, that's one of the reasons i really picked up this book and then i realized what he thought the author means uh, this author named peter burwash this person says that our entire life like say 1977 to 2020 it is represented by one dash in between 1977 dash 2020 so our entire life is that one small dash much after we are gone how the world remembers us depends on the quality of that dash if we really live life uh, in the best way then uh, people will remember us much after we are gone but if we uh, live life in not the best way people will actually feel happy that we are gone and therefore uh, the quality of our life depends on the quality of our relationships um it's not easy to maintain and sustain relationships relationships are like a bird if you squeeze it too much it dies if you set it free it flies but if you give it enough love and affection it stays so that sensitive thing between squeezing people out and setting them completely free that they go away from your life that sensitive uh, balance is what relationships is all about so today we're going to discuss a uh, you um, we will focus on friendship but the fact is that uh, what i'm going to speak can apply to any relationship of life uh, the unfortunate reality today is um when we uh, look at friends how do we choose friends we make friends um usually based on who is around us like uh, our classmates become our friends our uh, workmates become our friends our neighbors become our friends but the reality is friendship one of the most important basis of friendship is like mindedness if there is no like mindedness then uh, friendships cannot last um, and and friendships don't go deep so usually when you make your colleague your friend it's not necessary that there is like mindedness but, but you're just hanging around together so you end up becoming friends but that's not the way friends uh, friendship should be made the question that should be asked uh, for a lot of people when we talk about friendships you know for a lot of people 
uh, friendships are uh, usually a tool. So that means people make friends with those people that can be useful. That can be useful in some day, you know, some way. So we choose who becomes our friend depending on uh, you know, how we can utilize them. Relationships don't form like that and should not be formed like that. Relationships should not become a tool, but it should become a goal. Um, unfortunately, when we start uh, looking at relationships as a tool, we start thinking of using people. When we use people for our um, our you know ends, then um, those relationships are very selfish relationships, and those are not really deep relationships. Ideally, relationships are such where there's no condition. You don't expect anything from the other person. But the idea is to connect with the person at the level of love. Um, a lot of people forget the bigger picture and they try to make themselves the big picture. They forget the bigger picture of what the relationship is meant for. And they try to make themselves the big picture. Just like if you have a, if you have, if you played a, you know, you solved puzzles. When you throw these pieces of, of the puzzle on the table and uh, you want to solve the whole puzzle, if you have seen the complete picture just once, just once for a few seconds, you can easily solve the whole puzzle. But if you have never see, seen the full picture, it's very difficult to solve a puzzle. And therefore, unless and until we uh, remember the goal of the relationship, it becomes very difficult to actually deal with the relationship in the best possible way. And therefore, we need someone in our life to actually remind us of uh, the importance of uh, uh, people around us. So there are three ways to connect with friends. The first way is known as dependence. There are some people who become so much dependent on the other person that without that person, they can't function only. So some people develop that kind of uh, uh, connect. Some people are um, they develop a mindset of independence. That means I don't need anybody. So some people think that I cannot do anything without anybody, without someone in my life to help me. And the other person is other extreme. Things that I don't need anyone at all. I am I'm good enough on my own. Both of them are extreme ends and both don't work. What really works is the in-between way, which is our interdependence. That means I have some strengths and you have some weaknesses. And you have some strengths and I have some weaknesses. When we look at the combination of the strengths and weaknesses of each other, then we can actually do something wonderful. We can actually do something uh, amazing. The question of uh, relationships is uh, so very important to understand the concept of interdependence, uh, inspiring one another, um, helping one another uh, become a better version of oneself. That's what friends are meant for. Um, like in the Ramayan, there is a very interesting story when um, uh, Lord Ram meets Hanuman for the first time. So Hanuman is um, coming to test Ram and uh, Lakshman, Sugriv. This monk Vanara has sent Hanumanji to find out whether Ram and Lakshman are friends or enemies. So when Hanuman comes in front of Ram, he comes disguised. And he's disguised in the form of a bhikshuk sannyasi. So that means he's dressed like a beggar, basically. So when uh, Hanuman comes in front of Ram and uh, they're having a conversation, you know. So Ram, one of the first things he asked Hanuman is, if you are a beggar, then what are you doing in the forest? Because usually beggars don't beg in the forest. You don't get anything in the forest to beg, right? So beggars are there in the cities, villages, towns. And here was a beggar with a begging bowl in the forest. So Ram asked Hanuman first question, what are you doing in the forest if you're a beggar? And the second question Ram asked Hanuman was, if you're a beggar, what is a diamond necklace doing around your neck? Now when Hanuman heard that question, he was zapped. So he, he, he asks Ram, can you see it? Ram says, of course, I can see it. I can see the diamond necklace hanging around your neck. Hanuman looks at Lakshman and he asks him, can you see it? 
Lakshman says, no, I can't see any diamond necklace. And Hanuman immediately falls to the feet of Ram and he surrenders his life to Ram. Because in his younger days, uh, Lord Brahma had given, the, given him this diamond necklace. And Brahma had told Hanumanji that no one will be able to see this necklace around your neck. Absolutely no one. But the one person who will see the necklace, you should know that person is your master. Surrender a life to that person. And Hanumanji, when he saw that Ram actually saw the necklace, he realized this person is my master. He's my uh, best well-wishing friend. And he actually surrendered to him. Um, each one of us have a diamond necklace around our neck that nobody can see. Sometimes our parents also can't see the diamond necklace around our neck. Sometimes our best friends, relatives, I mean, the closest of close people cannot see the diamond necklace around our neck. But there will always be some person in your life who will spot the diamond necklace around your neck and actually show you. They will, the diamond necklace represents our good qualities. The diamond necklace represents uh, our talents, our abilities, our strengths. Sometimes we ourselves cannot see our strengths, cannot see our abilities, cannot see our talents. And it needs someone who can understand us, who can actually see the invisible in us and point out. And those friends are very special category of friends. Uh, in this book, I write about four levels of friendship. Usually, we, for us, the word friend means friend. That's all, you know. But in Sanskrit, there are four names given for four levels of friendship. The first level of friendship is known as Bandhu. Bandhu means those who are our colleagues or associates. We can have thousands of Bandhus and we do have thousands of Bandhus. All those people on your Facebook, they're all your Bandhus. They're not your friends. So they are first level of friendship, basically. So Bandhus are people you hang around with. Bandhus are people that you meet once in a while, you meet often also, but you don't have a heart to heart connect with Bandhus. Bandhus exist in your life and they're very important. In fact, they are sources of your networking. The more Bandhus you have, the better it is, and the better, the more net, uh, well networked you are. But that's the first level of friendship. The second level of friendship is known as Sakhas. Sakhas are friends are a little deeper than Bandhus. You spend more time with Sakhas. And in fact, Sakhas demand your time. Bandhus don't demand your time. If you give them time, it's fine. If you don't give them time, it's okay. But Sakhas demand your time. They need a little more time than you because they want to make inroads into your heart. And by giving them time, you are making inroads into their heart. So Sakhas are very important in life. They are not as many as Bandhus, but Sakhas are also quite a lot in our own lives. We will have many Sakhas coming in in our life. Um, the third level, so Sakhas come and then the problem is not all Sakhas remain connected with us for life. There are few who remain connected with us for a few years and then beyond that we go in different directions. Then there are some people who are known as Priya Sakhas. This is the third level of friendship. Priya Sakhas are best friends. These are people, no matter where we go, they are behind us. They're always after us. And the, when, you time, when you spend time with Priya Sakhas, when you spend time with these people, every time you come back, you come back much happier. You come back and excited. You are so filled with joy and uh, gratitude. Priya Sakhas, they know things that nobody else knows. They stand by you when nobody else stands by you. They are people who uh, help you grow. They are people who actually are your best well-wishers. They don't envy you. They celebrate your success. They, um, they cry along with you when you go through pains. Priya Sakhas are rare, but uh, they do exist. Every one of us and Priya Sakas are typically those people who are, uh, who have, you know, stayed with us through all our ups and downs. And finally, the fourth level of friendship is the deepest level of friendship, which is known as Suhrit. Suhrit means, uh, Suhrit is 
higher than best friends they are usually so deep in your uh, in your consciousness they are surats are very rare you know not everybody has a surat surat are considered to be the best of best friends you will have one or maximum two surats in your entire life and these are people sometimes they act as your mentors but these are people when you are in big trouble the first person you think of calling is your surat the first person you think of reaching out to is your surat and these people who actually stand by you no matter what happens so these are very rare species of people now just analyze in your own lives you know you had so many friends and we call everybody friends the question is does everyone fall in the same category impossible and then you should really understand what category of friends you have and according to the kind of friends you have and the kind of category of friends you have we need to prioritize time we need to prioritize our uh, you know connections to really enhance friendships to really enhance our connection with friends we need to do four things which are considered to be the four a's of effective friendship uh these four things are very powerful tools in which we can actually enhance the quality of our connections the, uh, the quality of our uh, relationship with our friends uh, these are very simple things but the reality is that these simple things are unfortunately never done by us and because these simple things are not done by us we seldom find our relationships enhancing and when i when i'm going to talk to you about these four a's you can apply these four a's to all levels of relationships and it will give you amazing results the first a is known as acceptance we need to learn to accept people as they are rather than expecting them to become as we are the unfortunate part is that we try to make others a photocopy of ourselves we try to make others uh, exactly like us whatever likes and dislikes we have we expect them also to have the same likes and dislikes whatever we uh, you know we love to do we expect them also to love to do the same things and we push people to become photocopies of us in so many ways acceptance uh enhances relationships expectations is a seed of misery the more we expect people to become like us the more we strangle the relationship we squeeze the relationship and the more we accept people as they are we actually enhance the relationship um unfortunately today um people have so much expectations from others and in every relationship you know and if that expectation is not met they just cut off from the relationship they they feel that you know i don't want to continue anymore and uh, unfortunately that's what the culture of uh, you know uh, use and throw is today we use people and if they are if they don't meet our expectations anymore we throw them away and get somebody else into our life so this whole idea of acceptance uh makes us very peaceful acceptance makes us understand that people are different people are not difficult they just different so we think that people are difficult but actually people are not difficult people are just different and the moment we accept that people are different and we are okay with that um life becomes much more easier uh relationships become much more better so the first a is acceptance uh in the mahabharat vidura he speaks a very wonderful example this is a part of mahabharat on his vidura niti and vidura gives example he says human beings should become like garland makers so if you have seen garland makers or if you have ever made garlands yourself you will understand this garland makers when they take flowers and they take a needle in their hand they pierce the flowers with needles but you know the flowers are very delicate you should know where to pierce if you pierce in the wrong place the flower breaks you know so the garland makers are extremely careful when they handle flowers 
because they know flowers are very delicate. So, um, so Vidura says human beings should be like garland makers, and others are like flowers. Our friends are like flowers. When we are handling them, we're making a garland you know, out of these flowers. We should know that we need to be very careful and sensitive because flowers break very fast. Um, hearts break very fast. And the more careful you are in your dealing with your friends and the more careful you are, don't poke them in the wrong place. Don't pierce them in the wrong way. Uh, and uh, don't hurt them in the wrong way. Today, people hurt each other so much in the name of friendship, in the name of, uh, you know, informal connect. I, I know people who, rather than actually talking respectfully to each other, they only give bad words to each other. And they think it's, it's cool. They think it is deep friendship, actually. So what, what are they doing, actually? They are actually piercing each other's hearts and hurting each other and hurting the relationship also. So first A is known as acceptance. The second A is known as appreciation. Um, how many times do we really appreciate our friends? And how much do we take, take them for granted? Just giving you an example from the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna and Arjun were best of friends. They had such deep appreciation for one another. Just to tell you how they appreciated one another, it's very important to hear this. Uh, if you read Bhagavad Gita, you read Bhagavatam, you read any of the Vedic scriptures, you'll find this very commonly there. Whenever people are addressed, they're called by the different names. Like for example, when Krishna would call Arjun, he would sometimes call him as uh, Savya Sachi, sometimes he'll call him as Dhananjay, sometimes he'll call him as Gurakesh. So he'll call him by different names, call him as Kaunteya. And when Arjun would call Krishna, Arjun would call Krishna also by different names. Sometimes he would call him as Madhusudan, sometimes he would call him as you know, uh, Govinda, sometimes he would call him as Arisudan. He'd keep calling him by different names. Now you might wonder, why do they call the same person by different names? So it's a very interesting psychology. When Arjun is calling Krishna by different names, every time he's appreciating one of the qualities of Krishna. And when Krishna is calling Arjun by different names, every time he's appreciating one of the qualities of Arjun. Like when Krishna calls Arjun as Savya Sachi, he is telling Arjun, he's actually appreciating the quality of Arjun being ambidextrous. That means he can fight with both hands. Uh, when Krishna is calling Arjun as Buddha Kesha, he's appreciating the quality of Arjun uh, being, uh, able, uh, having conquered sleep. So every time Krishna is appreciating a different quality of Arjun, he is actually appreciating Arjun just by taking his names. Appreciation is not a tactic. It's a part of the culture. You don't have to take out a separate time to appreciate. Appreciation happens in the flow of the conversation. Appreciation happens very naturally. And appreciation happens from the heart. The third A is known as acknowledgement. So first A is acceptance. Second A is appreciation. The third A is acknowledgement. People need to be acknowledged in your life. Their presence needs to be acknowledged. People should not be taken for granted. A lot of times in, in relationships, we tend to take people for granted. We tend to think that where is this guy going to go? He's a part of my life. He'll remain like this only forever. We tend to take people for granted. And only when we lose them, we understand their value. Um, just to give you a very interesting insight into this. Uh, I'm sure all of you all would have heard of Kashi. Now, Kashi is a place where uh, it is said, if anyone dies in Kashi, Lord Shiva comes and chants the holy name of Ram in their ears. Guaranteed moksha, guaranteed liberation. So a lot of people in India plan their death so that in such a way that they die in Kashi. In India, a lot of planning goes around, you know, and they plan finances, they plan, you know, family, they plan everything, they plan education, wealth. They also plan death. In Kashi, there is a place which is known as uh, Kashi Labha Mukti Bhavan. 
It's a guest house. And this guest house is meant for people who want to die. So if you want to die, you can check into this guest house and you're given two weeks to die, 14 days. If you don't die in 14 days, you have to check out. That's all, you're, you don't get more chance. So a lot of people check in in, a, in this guest house and exactly within 14 days they die. Imagine what kind of planning goes on in India, you know. Uh, and there's a manager who attended, uh, who is a part of this guest house and who's been managing this guest house for almost close to around uh, uh, 20 years. And he has seen, you know, 25, 30,000 deaths in his guest house. And a lot of realizations that he speaks about, of the many things he speaks, one of the things he speaks is very interesting. He says that um, one of the biggest um, repentance that people have, one of the things that people do very often in the guest house before they die, is they call their relatives or friends whom they have had some kind of fight many years back. They call and they say, sorry. There was one uh, man who came to the guest house to die and he stayed there for almost 13 days. On the 13th day, he called his brother and he called him to the guest house. These two brothers had not spoken to each other for 25 years. 25 years, they had not spoken a single word to each other. And they had a you know, uh, they create a wall in the house, partition the house into two halves. And 25 years later, one day before dying, he calls his brother and he tells him, I'm sorry, please forgive me. 25 years it took him to tell one sorry. And then he tells him, please break that wall. And then the next day this man dies. So this, this manager, his realization was, if these people only had to uh, drop that grudge that they're holding for such a long period of time, they would have slept so peacefully in their life. 25 years, this guy is holding that uh, guilt in his heart, the grudge in his heart, and probably he's not been able to sleep properly. But before he dies, he wants to be peaceful and he wants to drop this grudge. And that's what uh, the idea of acknowledgement is. So when we acknowledge people, that means we actually understand the value of their presence in my life, in our lives. And only when we understand the value of them in our lives, can we seriously uh, contemplate on how important the relationship is for us. So the third, third A is known as acknowledgement. So the first A is acceptance. The second A is appreciation. And the third A is acknowledgement. And if you don't do the, these three A's, then a fourth A follows which is known as alienation. Alienation essentially means people start feeling that they are dealing with aliens. That aliens are people you don't understand. Uh, they don't understand you. You don't understand them. They speak a different language. You speak a different language. And communication just doesn't happen between the aliens. Uh, and that's what happens. If in a friendship, there is no, uh, there's not enough acceptance, not enough appreciation, and not enough acknowledgement. And therefore, um, friendship uh, for these these four A's are extremely important for sustaining and for uh, maintaining relationships. As I said, one of the most powerful things that can happen among uh, friends is communication. Good friends are those who know or who communicate with one another wonderfully. Um, what is communication? Communication is the art of connecting heart to heart. If you cannot connect with another person's heart, then communication is just not happening. So a lot of times we may physically be sitting next to each other, but no communication is happening. Now, if you go to Sony uh, restaurants and look at what is happening in the in, in, in these places, or just walk around even in uh, uh, parks and malls, you just walk around anywhere where groups of friends are meeting. The interesting thing is most of them are inside their own phones. They're not talking to each other. They're not connecting with each other. And uh, uh, th there is no heart to heart connect, unfortunately. And therefore, uh, when communication is uh, heart to heart, those communications uh, help you connect with people. Uh, I often tell the story from the Mahabharata. Uh, there's a, there's a, uh, there are two stories 
uh, which talk which together talk about communication and this talk about friendships. Um, the first story is about uh, Krishna and Arjun. So when uh, Arjun's son Abhimanyu dies in the war, uh, and Arjun takes a vow that he will kill Abhimanyu's uh, the person responsible for Abhimanyu's death, whose name is Jayadrat, before sunset the next day, and uh, he says, "If I don't kill Jayadrat by sunset, I will commit suicide." So Arjun actually he uh, takes a vow like this, and the next day uh, they begin the war at sunrise, and Krishna and Arjun are. driving at full speed towards jayadrat and the kauravas have kept jayadrat right at the end of the army they know that if jayadrat is saved then arjun will die practically half the war is won and jayadrat so um, in krishna and arjun are chasing jayadrat like mad practically more than half days over and um, you know so many hours of fighting and intense battle and at the end of half day You know, practically, it's like you know, two o'clock, three o'clock types. You know, Krishna tells Arjun that the horses are dying. If you don't stop now, the horses will die out of exhaustion. So Arjun says, "Fine, let's take a break." Now imagine what does taking a break at this point in life mean? Taking a break at this point essentially means that Arjun's life is in danger. Taking a break at this point means that much closer Arjun is to death. so now is arjun's life more important or the horse's life more important technically arjun's life is more important but life is life whether it is horses or arjun's it doesn't matter and people who are actually having a heart they bother about life and you know don't want to be unnecessary cause of hurting somebody else so arjun says fine let's take a break and he creates a wall of arrows and krishna he takes the horses into that wall and he's feeding them grass he's feeding them water he is massaging them he's taking good care of them and after about an hour or so of you know good re- recuperation krishna brings the horses out out and he says we're ready again arjun gets on the chariot and they continue fighting i'm just taking a pause for this story i'll come back to the story a little later i'm going to another story where uh towards uh, the second half of the war practically the third half of the war uh karna becomes the commander in chief of the army and when karna becomes the commander he tells duryodhan i can kill arjun right uh, tomorrow itself but i have a problem duryodhan asks him what's the problem he says uh if i have a driver like krishna i can kill arjun tomorrow only now imagine you know like sometimes small children when they go to uh, answer exams and if they fail in the exam and they ask when they ask why you failed they say pen didn't work properly now what is the connection between good pen and exams you know but a lot of sometimes you know you want to blame someone to uh, for your failure so krishna uh, uh, karna said if i don't get a good driver like uh, krishna then i can i can't kill arjun so duryodhan said where am i going to find a driver like krishna so Ar- karna said see i don't know about that but i can tell you a recommendation he said there is one uh, king whose name is shalya and he is as good as krishna in driving chariots if he becomes my driver then i can surely win the war now duryodhan says shalya is not your friend why will he become your driver karna said see if i, if I don't get shalya as my driver i can't win the war So Duryodhan goes to Shalya and tries to convince him to become Karna's driver. And Shalya has no interest in becoming Karna's driver. He says, "I hate that guy. Why should I become his driver?" Duryodhan ple- uh, pleads with him, you know, really, really begs him, and finally somehow convinces him to become uh, Sh- uh, Karna's driver. Shalya says, "I'll become his driver on one condition. The condition is that I'll speak whatever I want." So Duryodhan says, "No problem. Speak whatever you want, but drive his uh, chariot." And then Shalya goes to become Karna's driver. So when Shalya sits on the chariot of Karna, and Karna uh, gets on, immediately Karna tells Shalya, "Take me to Arjun." Shalya tells him, "It looks like you want to die today." Now, Karna is bewildered. I mean, what a way to address the warrior. So Sh- Karna says, "Why don't you just shut your mouth and drive the uh, chariot?" Shalya says, "Truth, when spoken, is always bitter." Karna says, "See, I don't blame you. Your parents have not raised you properly." 
Shalya says, at least I know who my parents are. Do you know who your parents are? And then Karna gets so furious. He says, everybody in your country is like this. And Shalya says, what are you talking about me? I will tell you who you are. And he begins to blast Karna. And Karna begins to blast Shalya. They're like really abusing each other in the middle of a war. You know, in all directions fights are going on. And these two guys are fighting with each other. And finally, somehow, uh, they reach where uh, Arjun is. So when uh, Karna reaches Arjun, Karna takes out an arrow and, uh, you know, puts it on his bow. And he is aiming the arrow at the neck of Arjun. Shalya, he's an expert warrior. He understands, you know, uh, the science of, uh, of bow and arrows. So he sees, immediately he tells Karna, don't aim at the neck of Arjun. Aim at the chest of Arjun. Karna says, once I take aim, I don't change. Shalya says, don't be a fool. You're not Lord Ram to say that. Just change your uh, aim, aim at the chest. Karna shoots the arrow at the neck of Arjun. And Krishna sees the arrow coming fast towards the neck of Arjun. And Krishna has few seconds to act. He understands that Arjun is not going to be able to do it. So Krishna, he simply stamps on the chariot. He hits his feet on the chariot. And as soon as Krishna hits his feet on the chariot, the horses understand what Krishna wants them to do. And the horses simply fall on their knees. They fall on their knees. And as soon as the horses fall on the knees, the whole chariot goes down. And the arrow passes above Arjun's head. And Arjun's neck is saved. So Shalya looks at Karna and told him, I told you don't aim at the neck, aim at the chest. And then both of them continue fighting. So I'm stopping the two stories here. And let's analyze those two stories from the point of view of friendship. So Krishna and the horses, they were from different species. And they spoke different language. Karna and Shalya were from the same species and they spoke the same language. Krishna and the horses, communication was perfect. So when the horses were tired, Krishna understood. And when Krishna stamped his feet, the horses understood. And in the case of Karna and Shalya, the communication was imperfect. What Shalya was trying to say, Karna is not able to understand. And what Karna is trying to say, Shalya is not able to understand. The question is, what is communication? So communication is not just about speaking words, but it's about expressing your heart in such a way that it reaches somebody else's heart. Therefore, I always say, in today's world, we have so many communication tools. We have so many mediums of communication, phones and emails and messengers, WhatsApp, so many ways of communication. But is communication better today? The reality is, the unfortunate reality is, today, communication is at its worst. We have so many ways of communicating with one another, but communication is not happening. Why is communication not happening today? The reason is simple. Before one communicates with one another, one has to learn to connect with one another. Unless and until one learns to connect with one another, heart to heart, communication cannot happen. In the case of Krishna and the horses, Krishna was able to understand the needs, interests and concerns of the horses. And because Krishna was able to understand the needs, interests and concerns of the horses, the horses were able to understand his needs, interests and concerns. In the case of Karna and Shalya, because Karna was not able to understand Shalya's needs, interests and concerns, what does Shalya need? He wanted respect. He was a king. Don't treat him like a servant. So he, he, if only Karna had respectfully asked Shalya, he probably would have agreed. But Karna actually forced Shalya into doing something that he didn't want to do. And what was Karna's need? Karna's need was for a need for a friend. When he said, I want a driver like Krishna, he actually didn't want a driver. What he wanted was he was missing a friend like Krishna. Arjun had a friend like Krishna who he can discuss with. And Karna had no one that he could open his heart to. And therefore, that's what his need was. He didn't mean to need a driver as such. So the point is, communication happens when connection happens. Connection happens when you understand the needs, interests and concerns of the other person. Usually we are so busy understanding our needs, interests and concerns that we don't bother about other people's needs, interests and concerns. And therefore relationships just don't thrive. 
just don't grow. And therefore, for us to actually understand the importance of relationships, we need to understand the importance of communicating with one another. Unfortunately, the most talented people are also the most lonely people in the world. The more talented you are, you end up becoming more lonely. Why? Because talent can help you so much in your life. But when it comes to relationships, talent never works. In fact, people who are highly talented are people who cannot get along with anybody else. They just you know, want to be on their own. And you'll find this in all organizations in the world today. Very talented people cannot function in teams, cannot function in groups, and they just want to be on their own. And one of the greatest um, curses for relationships is talent. If you don't have talent, you probably can develop good relationships in life. But if you have talent, you have to really work hard to develop relationships. Because the problem with talent is, talented people feel they know everything and they don't need anybody. But the reality is, this world is designed in such a way that nobody can do everything alone. Nobody can manage everything alone. We need people. Even the best of the brains cannot do everything. And therefore, the very fact that we need people means that talent is just not enough for us to uh, become successful in life. Along with talent, we also need good attitude in life. And unfortunately, uh, relationships don't work when uh, we have we carry bad attitudes. Uh, a lot of people who struggle in relationships are those people who have intensely bad attitudes. What does bad attitude do to you? Bad attitude uh, makes you a loner, makes you feel I don't need anybody else. Bad attitude um, makes you feel that I have solutions to all problems of life. So that means people with bad attitude are people who like to speak a lot and they don't like to listen. They like to speak so much because they feel they know everything and they don't need to listen because others don't know anything or I'm not going to get anything from anybody else. But the reality of life is that each and every one of us have to be a lifelong learner. The more we listen to others, the more we grow, the more we, uh, we actually upgrade ourselves. And the less we listen to others, the more we are frustrated, the more we suffer. And especially, uh, we, um, we, we desperately uh, suffer in relationships. And therefore, um, uh, bad attitudes actually destroy relationships. And the last thing I want to speak about is uh, the idea about judging. A lot of people, when we look at others, especially when we look at, uh, look at our friends, our analysis of others are actually expressions of our own needs, uh, needs and uh, values. When we look at somebody else, we are actually looking at ourselves only. Uh, and, uh, you know, like I'll, I'll tell you a story from the Mahabharat. So in the Mahabharat, we find Dronacharya, the guru of the Kauravas and the Pandavas, he once called Duryodhan. And he told Duryodhan, I want you to go into the kingdom and at least find one person who is better than you. Duryodhan went, met thousands of people and he came back and he said, sorry, I couldn't even find one person better than me. Every person I saw had one weakness which I didn't have. And he had a whole list of you know, people's names and their defects. Dronacharya called Yudhishthir and he told him, Please go into the kingdom and find at least one person who is worse than you. Yudhishthir went into the kingdom and he came back and he said, I'm sorry, I couldn't even find one person worse than me because every person I saw had one good quality which, uh, which um, I didn't have. So Duryodhan was able to see fault in every person and Yudhishthir was able to see fault, good in every person. Our, um, anal our analysis of others are expressions of our own needs and values. So when we look at somebody else and we find something in them, it's actually in us. When we look at somebody else and we say, oh, this person is very critical. Maybe I am the person who's critical. When I look at somebody else and I, and I think that this person is very uh, cunning, maybe I am the person who is cunning. When I look at somebody else and I say, this person is very cruel, 
maybe i am the person who is very cruel and when i look at somebody else and i say this person is very kind maybe there is kindness in me so when we look at others and analyze others we need to remember our analysis of others are expressions of our own needs and values and therefore i always say for everything in life we prepare so much we prepare for interviews we prepare for you know uh, getting into universities and colleges we prepare for you know uh, so many exams in life but the question is do we really prepare ourselves to get into friendships do we really prepare ourselves to get into any kind of relationships unfortunately we feel that in this particular case we don't need any preparation we are already qualified but the reality is that each one of us need to prepare to get into these deeper uh, relationships of life and the more prepared we are and the more um, thoughtful we are and the more uh, we understand these relationships the better we get in dealing with them and uh, making them and keeping them hare krishna stop here any quick questions or comments if there is we can all unmute ourselves and you can stop your you can open your videos as well yeah the so, prabhu ji i just wanted to ask you like you know we generally have lot of uh, friends to begin with and sometimes we are very close friends but after some period of time you know uh, when we the distance becomes more then you tend to forget it you know, why does this happen that you know, we are not able to you know, connect to some old friends whom we really loved so much at one point of time priorities change yeah priorities because priorities change uh, uh the connections change um but obviously if there are very deep connections the deep, deep uh, relationships you may not have stayed in touch with them for 20 years but the moment you call you you begin exactly where you left so there are some relationships that are uh, that uh, deep you know because you have invested so much time in them and uh, they can be revived at any point in time and such relationships should be invested in because anything you invest time in grows if you invest time in business it grows if you invest time in you know the stock market you know if you understand it better it grows if you invest time in learning knowledge uh, your knowledge grows anything you invest time in grows anything else any other yeah. question satish anybody i think mr ramesh I... just one second i think ramesh ayer is in sir can you uh, uh, start your video please mr ramesh ayer is he in i don't think so ji okay well, he mentioned message me that he is in so that's what i okay. thought Okay. Oh, maybe maybe then if he's in, I don't know. Yeah. In some other name, I don't. Know. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead with your questions. So this is Vivek here, Vivek Anand. Uh, I have a, a small question. Uh, you know, it's always said that uh, God is your best friend. Okay, and uh, He is your prana sakha, and uh, He is your atma sakha. So how do we nurture that, you know, uh, and do we see that God in everyone who is our close friends, or you, uh, you know, that friendship with God is at a different level, and uh, you know, uh, how do we, uh, how do we nurture that? Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, uh, you know, God is our best friend. He is known as Dina Bandhu. He is known in so many ways as uh, our close friend. Uh, in fact uh, god is in every heart as a parmatma you cannot have anybody closer to your heart than uh, than the supreme lord himself now that is definitely um, the the reality uh, the way we revive and uh, you know uh, develop that friendship is by investing uh, in it just like you know just uh, from a practical point of view if you see how do you develop friendships in this world you develop friendship first by connecting and you know that that person exists and then once you know that the person exists what do you do then you invest time in uh, knowing that person developing knowledge about that person you ask that person questions and you get answers you ask a person about his likes and dislikes and you get answers and that way slowly slowly begin to know that person 
and then you give gifts to that person and then around you receive gifts from that person and then you invite that person to eat and you get invited to eat and that is how the relationship grows in this world that's exactly how you develop relationship with god also first thing is that you get to know that he exists and then once you know that he exists then you get to know more details about him you know uh, there are so many details that you can know about god and then the more details you know the more closer you fa- you feel with him and uh, not just that and then you uh, you know give him gifts just like we visit temples and offer flowers offer something to the lord that's how we develop our relationship with god and then god has already given you so many gifts and we express gratitude for receiving uh, those unlimited gifts of god and then just like we invite our friends to eat and we, we get invited to eat similarly we offer something to god on a daily basis and then we eat something uh, so we share what uh, what we eat and that's how the relationship with god uh, gets developed our friendship with god gets developed obviously uh, he is our best friend and we revive that in the same way but uh, the fact also is that uh, he is not just in your heart he is in everybody's heart because god is in everybody's heart when we uh, when we understand that there is a spark of god in everybody's heart a spark of divinity in everybody's heart we tend to be respectful towards everyone we tend to be uh, we tend to honor everyone because we understand that there is a divine element in them also and that's that's how respect develops towards other people and that is how our vedic culture teaches us to uh, respect not just people even things as uh, having the divinity of element of god not just people we respect things also we respect rivers as personalities we respect you know uh, trees as personality we respect practically everything as personality because we understand there's a divine spark in all of that i hope i make sense uh, vivekanand ji yes thank you so much i'm very grateful thank you yes sucha yes, bacha uh, hari krishna guru ji uh, i wanted to know that uh, my question is not as deep as vivekan it's more earthly as we meet new people uh, in uh, life when we go ahead and uh, now we are a little more uh, serious vinod ji vinod ji sucha just one second vinod ji just uh, mute your uh, phone please ओके whether they'll align with my thoughts or not so i also know judging is wrong so but when new people come into your life uh, how do we treat this uh, situation when you need to deal with them on a daily basis but you internally feel that they are not aligning with your thoughts and ideas i tell you a story from the panchatantra a very interesting story panchatantra tells us a story of a, of the crocodile and a monkey i don't know whether you remember this story So essentially, there's a monkey that was staying on a tree, and it was uh, staying on a tree that had very tasty berries. And uh, the monkey was eating these berries and enjoying itself for staying on this tree. So one day, a crocodile happened to uh, visit the tree, and when the monkey saw a guest, uh, the monkey decided to offer some berries to the crocodile. So the crocodile opened its mouth, and the monkey threw berries into its mouth, and the crocodile loved the taste of these berries. and from that day on was the crocodile started visiting the monkey every single day you know and they became you know uh, they started connecting with one another at one point the crocodile's wife she started suspecting where this fellow is going and then disappeared so many hours he doesn't come back and uh, so then uh, the crocodile explained i found a new friend this monkey and uh, you know he gives me so many nice berries and then he bought berries for for his wife the next day and uh, the wife she loved the berries but she suddenly had an idea she thought <clears throat> if the berries are so tasty imagine how tasty the monkey will be who is eating berries all day long so she said i want to eat the heart of the monkey get me the heart of the monkey the crocodile said he is my friend how can i get you his his heart the wives are nothing doing you know i want you know the situation is quite similar in uh, everywhere i guess uh, so the crocodile was really in anxiety you know he had to please his wife so he uh, went to the monkey and he said you know uh, 
uh, I want to give you a, a joy ride today in the river. Can you come with me? And the monkey said, of course. He jumped on the back of the crocodile and the crocodile started swimming into the river. When they reached right in the middle of the river, the crocodile decided, it's, I think I should tell the truth to the monkey. He said, you know, see, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not taking you for a joy ride, but I'm taking you to my wife who wants to eat your heart. The monkey said, oh, really? Why didn't you tell me? I forgot to bring my heart. My heart is in the tree only. And the crocodile panicked. You know, he, the crocodile realized he's going to get really beaten up if he takes the monkey without his heart. And he, so he, obviously the crocodile didn't understand what his wife meant. So uh, he, he said, now what to do? The monkey said, very simple. We'll just go back to, my, to home. I'll bring my heart and come back. The crocodile said, yes, yes. And he went back again. And they reached the monkey's tree. And the monkey jumped up on the tree, you know, and he reached right on top of the tree. And then he quoted a shloka. Very interesting shloka, you know, a Sanskrit shloka. It says, Dadati Pratagrinati, Guhya Makhyati Pruchati, Bhumte Bojayate Chayeva, Shadvida Preeti Lakshanam. Uh, and he, he actually gave a lot of wisdom to the crocodile. And one of the things that he spoke, which really brings the essence of what friendship is, he told the crocodile that just like, <clears throat> so he said, both of us, we are from different worlds. And both of us, our, we, uh, we are not like-minded. So he said, when I said I left my heart in the tree, what does it mean? It simply means my heart is not in this relationship anymore. My heart is in my tree. That means I don't belong to this relationship. My, my heart is there. you know. So I, I belong to some other connect. So essentially, what happens is like-mindedness is extremely important for relationships to work. So the way your mind functions is the moment you, you somebody enters into your life, you immediately start seeing if that person is like-minded or not. So if that like-mindedness filter doesn't exist, then you attract the wrong energy into your life. And then you'll have so much of difficulty in undoing the wrong energy. So they, therefore, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, what do you call it, these filters exist naturally in us, right? So I don't, I don't call it judging, but I would call it being selective. Being selective about whom you give your heart to. Don't just give your heart to everybody. You know, it might be a crocodile, it might take you and Give your heart to some uh, somebody else to eat up. Make sense, ma'am? Thank you so much. And the daughter on my back was reminding me of the monkey and the crocodile. So I felt like the crocodile suddenly. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> good, good. Anyone else? Yes, Satish. Hare Krishna Prabhuji. Uh, you said uh, like-minded, uh, we, we, for, for, for relationships, we look at like-mindedness. Uh, there's also an adage that, you know, like, uh, unlike poles attract each other and like poles repel each other. Any, any contradiction? Uh, you can say that. <laughs> But when you say that unlike poles attract each other, uh, the reality is that when you have, so what it really means is different people who have strengths and weaknesses. So each one has strengths and weaknesses, right? All of us have strengths and weaknesses. Um, uh, so those who have strength and a weakness, when you connect with somebody else who has another strength and a weakness, when they match with each other, that's what unlike poles are. So that means your strength may be my weakness and somebody else's weakness may be my strength. When we come together, we become a very powerful team, basically. That's what is, me, is the meaning of the, that, that concept of unlike poles attract one another. Make sense? <laughs> Keshavji, you want to ask something? See that? Uh, so, yeah. Uh, Jagdish. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I have one question. Uh, Hare Krishna Shubhilaji. Uh, pleasure to really have you here again. 
and to be a part of this conversation i just wanted to ask you uh, one thing since uh, you know the most cherished friendship uh between god uh, and bhakta is an analogy of lord krishna and arjuna uh and uh did arjuna really do something to strive for that uh, sakya bhakti uh and if we want to uh, reach uh, have that friendship with god right what what kind of uh, qualities that we develop and again is it uh, by some qualification that we became become uh, a friend of god or is it a choice of god that makes anybody a friend with or without qualities so as far as arjun is concerned uh, so the reality is no friendship happens without endeavor from both sides um it's impossible for any friendship any kind of relationship to happen without endeavor from both sides uh in case of arjun and krishna it was very natural that they connected with one another it's not that you know they uh arjun had to put too much effort to become krishna's friend they already had a certain amount of like mindedness first of all they were of the same age you know first of all and the second thing is that they just connected at so many levels you know to study the mahabharat nicely so many levels they just connected with each other and they just thought exactly same as one another so and of course arjun put so much efforts to be uh, uh, you know to connect with his friend and krishna also put that much effort to connect with his friend you know i mean see relationships don't happen without sacrifice whether you, whether you call it sacrifice of time sacrifice of energy sacrifice of efforts sacrifice of so at so many levels you know and if you look at arjun and krishna's uh, friendship both of them sacrificed so much and then the relationship really became so powerful and so fruitful um we can go on some other time discussing the details of arjun and krishna's relationship itself but the fact is that the endeavor is from both sides and the fact also is that it just clicked like this you know and uh, arjun was so much into krishna that eventually arjun's one more name was krishna people actually began to call him krishna i don't know if you all have experience like this you know when two people are just so closely connected to one another they actually start looking like one another they actually start thinking like one another you know especially it happens in husband wife relationships but it also happens among friends basically so that means arjun also invested so much of his heart and energy into that friendship basically and that's how that friendship became so deep and obviously for a people like us to aspire for a friendship like that so it's not that nobody can become a sakha of krishna but nobody can become a sakha like arjun so that's different you know and uh, that's a different level of uh, relationship itself but you can become sakha of krishna of your own type you know you don't have you can't become like somebody else because each one who is a, who is a friend of krishna is of a unique type you know and krishna relates to that person very differently compared to the way he relates with uh, arjun so yes you can want to be a friend of krishna first thing is that desire it begins with desire you know and the second thing is that it also takes an effort to be able to become uh, krishna's friend but i mean if you want to become uh, you know god's friend how much do you know about him how much effort are you putting to understand his psychology how much effort are you putting to understand his uh, thought process so when we really put efforts you know so what happens is many unfortunately many times we love to think about it but we seldom put efforts in that direction you know so it's not just about thinking in that direction but also putting efforts in that direction and then at some point in future when we really uh, deserve it the fructification will also happen like if somebody wants to connect to the prime minister the first is that you may have desire but are you putting uh, effort in that direction so if you put effort in that direction for one year probably you will do it also 100% you know anybody who is madly obsessed about anything definitely achieves it so that obsession is uh, you know determines your uh, you know destination really prabhu ji this is rajneesh here uh, yes i just wanted to understand that 
as long as uh, before the Gita was spoken, I think they were very good friends. And the moment uh, Arjuna realized the status of uh, Krishna, that he's God, then immediately he was very apologetic and he said that, how can I treat you as my friend? And I have done many mistakes uh, with you. Then can I, then he started treating him as his master. And how then if one of the friends reaches another status in life and you are maybe left at a lower level and you realize, ki, okay, I'm not at his same status. Then how, when there is so much of gap between where is God and who's got so much power with him. And whereas I am such an infinitesimally small person. So when this realization dawns upon you, it is very difficult to maintain a friendship uh, with that person. Yeah. Perfect. Wonderful question. Rajeshri, thank you for that question. So yes, you're right. When Arjun realized that Krishna is the Shurup, Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he really became bewildered. He got confused. He started begging forgiveness because when Krishna and Arjun sleep you know, on the same bed, uh, it would happen that in the middle of the night, Arjun would turn around in such a way that his leg lands upon Krishna's chest. You know, uh, I mean, it happens, right? Uh, he will <laughs> turn all, in all directions in sleep. So Arjun was feeling so bad that I put my leg on his chest and he, that's why he was asking, asking forgiveness so much. But then if you actually read the Gita carefully, his forgiveness and his asking for forgiveness lasted a little bit. And then he understood the grandeur of God. And then finally he told him, my dear Krishna, I can't see this. Come back to your original form. Come back to your original Shamsundar form. And he said, I can't handle this anymore. So then Krishna actually brought, went back to his original form and then the conversation between Krishna and Arjun uh, resumed like normal. And then you, you don't you don't find uh, Arjun speaking about the Vishwarupa, uh, speaking about the godliness of Krishna and all. Because that doesn't matter. He may be God, by the way, but it doesn't matter to Arjun. You know? For him, Krishna is his friend. Like I'll tell you my own, uh, I'll tell you my experience. You know? Um when, uh, I mean, I have so many of my friends from my school and college days, such deep, close friendships, you know. And then when I went on to join the monastery and I, uh, you know, and uh, um, people saw that I am really uh, becoming into a different uh, zone and uh, you know, becoming famous and all that. In the, in the beginning of my friends panicked, you know? they didn't know what to call me. They didn't know how to deal with me. They didn't know, you know, how to interact, you know. And then I had to tell them, Baba, I'm, the, I'm still the exact same person for you. Nothing has changed between you and me, you know. And then over a period of time, they actually understood nothing has changed between us. And now they are completely normal. And they just act uh, the way I, they used to always act with me. Uh, because I helped them become comfortable with that, right. So Krishna, that's exactly what he did with Arjun. He showed him who he is, you know. He showed him the whole Vishwaru form. But then he went back to his normal form. And he told Arjun, for you, I'm still the same person, basically. So that's the way in which Arjun dealt with Krishna. So yes, he apparently knows uh, Krishna is God, but that doesn't matter to him. Uh, in Vrindavan, in the, the Gopas, the friends of Krishna, they may know once in a while they come to know that Krishna is God. But they don't care a damn for that fact that he's God. For, for them, he's their friend. That's all that matters to them, you know. And Krishna also doesn't go on, go on telling them, I am God, do you know, don't, uh, you know, you can't defeat me and things like that. <laughs> Krishna also acted as a friend only, basically. I hope it, that made sense to you. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. your question. Okay. Yes, Kalpana Ji. Hi, Jayashi Krishna. I've got a very simple question. You know, very deep uh, relationship. Occasionally, there is a distance coming up between two people who were very good friends at one point of time. Now, we believe that once the relationship is broken, even if you try to get back together, is there any way, I mean, is that correct? Or you can have a friendship which is like seamless as it used to be before. And what has to be done to get back to that level of friendship? Because I do feel that occasionally there is this, you know, a little bit of uh, resistance, if not resistance, khalish jo bolte hain, wo reh jati hai. So how do you explain that? I'm going to tell you a story from the Ramayan that will help you understand this. And it, this is a very powerful story. That exactly right. 
uh, answers your point. So this is a story of the relationship between Sita and Ram. When uh, Ram was going to the forest, when he was told that he's going to go on, uh, has to go on exile for uh, 14 years, he goes to Sita and tells her that he's leaving. And uh, you know, he Sita wants to come with him. So Ram keeps denying, keeps giving so many excuses, and he kind of scares her how the forest is going to be bad and this and that. And he really, uh, you know, um, uh, dissuades her. But Sita is hell bent on coming. And at some point, Sita realizes that Ram is just not interested in taking her. So she was giving very logical answers. She in fact tells Sita, uh, tells Ram that in my when I was a small child, my mother, uh, you know, my father and mother brought me an, uh, a lady astrologer who actually predicted that I'll be going to the forest two times in my life. So she told Ram, I don't know whether you're going to the forest or no. I'm surely going, you know. She tells him, I've been prepared from that time. So she gives him so many reasons why she she wants to come with him to the forest. But Ram just doesn't understand. At some point, Sita gets fed up with all his, Ram's excuses and you know, uh, negative answers. And then she speaks something that really hurts Ram. She tells Ram, if my father Janak Maharaj was here and he had seen you behave like this, he would have felt that he has married his daughter to a girl who is dressed as a boy. She spoke like this to, to Ram. And Ram got bewildered, you know. And he said, okay, okay, you come with me. And then Ram just took her along, you know. But Sita knew that she has hurt his heart. She has caused a small dent in the, in the relationship. But she knew also that this was important for her to get Ram to take her along, you know. And she knew that she has 14 years to undo that uh, mistake or that scar that she has put in the relationship. Sita waited for the right time. So obviously those 14 years, uh, 13 years actually, uh, she really did her best to be with Ram, to uh, to do whatever best she can to you know love him, to take care of him, and whatever she, she could, she did. But her opportunity to completely undo that uh, thing came 13 years later, when uh, Shurpanaka uh, appeared in, in, uh, in their lives. And Shurpanaka created so much of uh, chaos in their life. And then eventually Shurpanaka's you know, first ENT surgery was done. You know, uh, And when Shurpanaka went away, she brought along with her Khardushan and 14,000 soldiers. So when these 14,000 soldiers along with Khardushan came to fight against Ram and Lakshman, Ram told Lakshman, take Sita into the cave. Now Lakshman was excited about fighting. Because in 13 long years, they've been carrying in the bow and arrow all the all around, but they never got to use it literally, you know. And Lakshman was excited for the fight, but Ram tells him, just take Sita and go to the cave. Lakshman is wondering what's wrong with him. 14,000 people are there. How is he going to deal with it alone? Ram just doesn't listen. He tells her, go into the cave. And Lakshman quietly goes into the cave and takes Sita along with him. And then Ram single-handedly destroys 14,000 soldiers. And after the whole fight, you know, massive massacre and massive fight. At the end of the whole fight, Ram is hurt in so many places. He's bruised. He's sweating. The dust from the uh, the, uh, the war field is on his body. And then he's standing on the, uh, uh, you know, over there with his bow on the ground. And Sita and Lakshman come out. And when Sita sees Ram, Ram doesn't say a single word. Sita runs towards Ram, embraces him. She says something very, very amazing. She says, if my father Janak Maharaj was here, he would have thought, after seeing your heroic activities, he would have married you to as many daughters as he has. So imagine, you know, Sita, just at the right moment, she undid everything she had, she had done. So it's not that they didn't have a scar. And it's not that that scar was not there. And it's not that Ram and Sita forgot about that incident. Both had it in the back of their mind, but they just kept it aside for the time being. And when Sita got the chance, she did what she could she, to undo uh, the, the mistake that she had done. And that's what sensitivity is. Did I answer your question? But, uh, but I still feel that in real life, when two friends drift apart, I mean, uh, really, how to get back? Because there the was, question, I mean... My, my simple question is, are you sensitive enough? That's, mm -hmm. my, that's my point. Are you sensitive enough? 
if you are sensitive like sita you will get an opportunity and when you get that opportunity are you humble enough if you are then you will be able to undo it if you are not then i'm sorry it will continue mm. all right thank you ji thank you I, I, yeah so we'll have one last question because i think prabhu ji also has to leave by 6:30 So I think one last. Jai, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm not sure if there's anyone else waiting to ask a question, but Jai, go ahead, go ahead. thank you, thank you so go much. I uh, really love that. I have a question about identifying so uh, you know friendships from previous incarnations. Uh, you know, how do you identify them in this incarnation, and how can we, uh, you know, really get together and build that divine friendship? i had a similar question i just wanted to ask a similar kind of on similar lines i wanted to know whether is something what friends we have is this predestined that you're going to meet and you're going to have these sort of friendships it's it's kind of similar that's why i thought that let me also ask the question simultaneously i read your mind no i'm just kidding <laughs> sorry thank you hello thank you thank you for the question uh, both the questions are wonderful my understanding is um previous lives what happens we won't know and there is hardly any way to really know about it but by experience is when you meet somebody some people the moment you meet them it just feels that i know this person forever and each one of us have experienced that you know each one of us have experienced some people uh, you know who just the moment you meet them you just feel that you know them forever it doesn't matter what was the connect in the previous life don't even try to go and explore it you know don't even try to explore it it's not needed what you really need to do is invest properly in this life when you if you're fortunate enough to find somebody that you really connect with wonderfully in this life forget the past think about the present and the future the the law of karma it's not about De, uh, dwelling about the past the law of karma is about action in the present and consequences for the future uh, and therefore my uh, uh, principle has always been what karmically has happened has happened which is not in your control but what is going to happen and uh, the consequences of what is going to happen is very much in your control so when you find those connects please invest in them and you will find them really wonderfully growing Now, obviously, they don't have a logical explanation. It's very intuitive, um, but intuition is very, very important in life. I read this, uh, read a book called The Blink. I don't know if any of you have read this book. It's a very powerful book, and it just talks about intuitions, and it talks about how powerful intuitions can be in taking the most powerful decisions of life. And the fact also is that, um, what is intuition from a spiritual point of view? from a spiritual point of view intuition is simply the paramatma connection from a spiritual point of view uh, intuition is simply the voice of paramatma telling you giving you a direction and if your the voice of paramatma is very strong then your intuitions will be very strong if you have invested in the paramatma very much if you invested in the, the in god in your heart very much your intuitions and your understanding and the decisions based on intuitions will be very powerful also Makes sense, both of you all. I hope I answered your questions. Thank you, thank you so much. You, you did indeed. Thank you. So I would like to leave all of you all with a thought. Uh, so basically, whatever I spoke is based on this book called The Magic of Friendships. Uh, this is uh, available all over. You can find it on Amazon. You can find it on Flipkart. So those who feel inspired by this discussion, and if you feel that you want to read more, so this book has so much more depth on. friendship at practically every level you know so i have uh, shared a lot of personal stories from it i've shared a lot of uh, uh, stories based on my discussions with people and understanding of friendship as well as from scriptures so every chapter has one story from the scripture it has a verse from the niti shastra uh, which talks about depth of our friendship it also has stories from modern life so it combine all this together uh, it creates a very very valuable treasure on uh, friendship especially it's a great gift to give to those who you all feel to be good friends so i will uh, share uh, so jagdish ji has the link of the book with uh, with him and he will most happily share uh, with all of you all 
those who like yes. to uh, get a copy of it please do thank you thank you yeah so satish yeah a wonderful uh, session uh, hari krishna prabhu ji i think it was uh, simply fabulous uh, some of the takeaways that i i thought i'll quickly summarize without uh, you know fully aware that you need to leave uh, but the diamond necklace around our neck and somebody tracing it out was i think a phenomenal uh, the four levels of friendship you know the bandhu saka priya saka and sorry i may not get the pronunciations the way you did it but i think it was uh, fantastic the four a's of appreciation um, the acceptance appreciation acknowledgement and the alienation was something which also uh, was terrific so the communication has to reach the heart and uh, i had heard somewhere that uh, communication is uh, something to do with the heart and something to do with the mind and the mouth is exactly in between so mouth is a good way to kind of communicate i remember again the nakar ni talking about uh, communication and the uh, the part of connecting that one needs to connect first before communication was simply uh, brilliant understanding needs and concerns of others which is something that uh, is a big take away for me and talent is is not enough i think this is this is a punch line which uh, which is fantastic uh, what is required is a good attitude the more we listen to others the more we grow and uh, obviously what also what you said about uh, don't judge others and uh, i just thought i'll take another two minutes if you have prabhu ji otherwise i'll stop uh, okay fantastic uh, i'll um, you know just tell about one friends group uh, since i have a collection of stories i'll just very quickly tell a story about a friends group a man who was regularly attending meetings with his friends without any notice stopped participating in the activity after a few weeks when very cold on a very cold night the leader of that group like in our case jampesh or uh, litesh or shridhar uh, uh, decided to visit him he found the man at home alone sitting in front of a fireplace where a bright and cozy fire burned guessing the reason of the visit the man welcomed the leader that was there was a great silence the two men only watched the dancing flames around the logs that crackled in the fireplace After a few minutes, the leader, without saying a word, examined the embers that formed and selected one of them and removing it and kept it on the side with a pair of tongs. Then he sat down. The host was paying attention to everything, fascinated but restless. Before long, the lone ember flame subsided until there was only one momentary glow, and the fire suddenly went out. In a short time, what was a sample of light and heat was nothing more than a black hole and dead piece of wood. very few words had been spoken during since the greeting the leader before preparing to leave with the pliers returned the cold the cold and useless coal placing it again in the middle of the fire immediately the ember was rekindled fueled by the light and heat of the burning coals around it when the leader reached the uh, door to leave the host said thank you for your visit and for your beautiful lesson i will read i will return to the group i remember this story when uh, prabhu ji has talked about appreciation and acknowledgement i think this was a wonderful way without even using the mouth which i said you know you have to use your heart and your and your so i remembered the story so why are the groups extinguished very simple because each member that withdraws takes fire and heat from the rest it is worth reminding members of a group that they are part of the flame it is worth it is good to remind that we are all responsible for keeping each other's flame burning and we must promote the union between all so that the fire is really strong effective and lasting it does not matter if sometimes we are bothered by so many messages that reach the chat what matters is to be connected some of us are silent others are very active the friends that we are here to meet learn exchange ideas or simply know that we are not alone that there is a group of friends colleagues and family whom we can count keep the flame alive thank you sir for being part of our bonfire Thank you, thank you. Very happy to be with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Thank you, Shivalas Prabhu ji. I think fantastic session. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, it has been a great pleasure and a great journey for last one and a half hours. Thanks, yeah. Jagdish, for thank inviting uh, Shivalas Prabhu ji. My pleasure. And very beautiful sum up uh, by Satish. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you thanks thank you thanks for thank participating you. and uh, have a great weekend thank you so much
Like what? Thank you. No announcements. No other announcements. <laughs> we will do it. <laughs> At least we don't mind having a session by you once. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. <laughs> she said, no, no. She said, Jagdish or Satish. I don't know. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Satish first, and then Jagdish later. <laughs> ah, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so next two session. <laughs> yes. So we have next week we have planned one, uh, one uh, Mr. Anchan Hari Anchan is going to be there. So we'll be just announcing it in uh, in the group. In I think by tomorrow we should be announcing that. So let's have some more fun in the next week. And, and keep calling your friends here. You each one have, of us at least one or two friends we can definitely invite. No, so I've been inviting a lot of people, but nobody showing interest. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You just keep on trying. I I call up 10, 12 people. Three or four turn up. Doesn't matter. You know. So as long as they say yes. You say agree. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Keep keep the flame burning. Yeah, that's more important. Uh, so th thanks everybody. Thanks Keshav ji. Thank you. Monji. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. I'll have a good day. Bye. Thanks, Kalpana for joining. Bye Kalpana. Thank yes. Thanks. Rajesh. Thanks Pidi. Ganesh. Chalo. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye. Yeah. Bye bye.